Ever wondered why a polar bear doesn't sunbathe on a tropical beach or why a cactus doesn't grow in the Arctic? It's not because they haven't tried vacationing, but because each organism, be it a plant or an animal, has a particular habitat where it thrives best. And that, dear friends, is what we're unraveling today, the fascinating mystery of habitats. Now what exactly is a habitat, you ask? Imagine it as a cozy home providing all the necessities of life, food, water, shelter, and the perfect conditions for raising a family. It's a bit like your bedroom, only much, much bigger. Different organisms need different habitats because of their specific requirements. For instance, a fish needs water to breathe, while a camel needs a desert to, well, be a camel. These habitats can be as vast as an ocean or as small as a single leaf, depending on the creature calling it home. And just like in any community, habitats have their own neighborhoods too. A group of interacting species sharing the same habitat, living together in harmony, or sometimes not so harmony. But hey, that's life. But here's the catch, not all habitats are created equal. Various factors can impact a community's ability to survive in a local habitat. Think of it as the neighborhood going through changes. Maybe there's less food around, or the weather's gotten too harsh. That's when the survival of the fittest comes into play. And speaking of food, every habitat has its own food chain, or should we say, food web. It's like a complex game of who eats whom, linking producers, consumers, and decomposers in an intricate web of life. But don't worry, we're not leaving you tangled in this web. We'll delve deeper into the world of carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores, and explore how animals have adapted over time to survive in their specific habitats. So it's all about finding the right fit, just like you wouldn't wear a snowsuit to the beach, right? Now, imagine you're a detective, investigating your local habitat and its secrets. Think of habitats as the ultimate backstage pass to life's concert, providing all the necessities organisms need to perform their best. But what are these necessities? Well, it's like preparing for a camping trip. You'll need food, water, shelter, and a suitable climate. Similarly, organisms need the same to survive. The food might be leaves for a caterpillar or nectar for a bee. Shelter could be a leafy canopy for a bird or a burrow for a rabbit. Water might be a local river or the morning dew on leaves. And the climate? Well, it's got to be just right. Not too hot, not too cold, like Goldilocks' perfect porridge. But it's not a free-for-all buffet. Each habitat has its unique menu, and you've got to adapt to enjoy it. Some habitats are like a fancy French restaurant, with a very specific selection, while others are like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Now let's talk about the community. It's like a bustling city where everyone has a role to play. From the towering oak tree producing oxygen to the tiny ant decomposing fallen leaves, each plays a vital part, interacting and relying on each other for survival. But, as in any city, there are factors that can affect the harmony. Imagine a sudden heat wave, or a new shopping mall replacing the local park. These can disrupt the delicate balance, affecting the survival of the community. Similarly, in a habitat, changes in climate or introduction of new species can disrupt the balance. A sudden drought might affect the availability of water, or a new predator might pose a threat to the existing population. Remember, every habitat is like a puzzle, and every organism is a vital piece. Each piece has its place and role, and the removal or addition of a piece can affect the whole picture. It's like trying to complete a jigsaw puzzle, but the image keeps changing. Fun, right? Well, that's the dynamic and ever-changing world of habitats for you. Who's up for a game of connect the dots? Except, these dots are organisms, and the lines, they are the food chains. Imagine, if you will, a vibrant green meadow. The grass, the flowers, they're not just there for decoration, they're what we call producers. They're the base of our food chain, turning sunlight into food through photosynthesis. It's like they're whipping up a green leafy buffet for everyone else in the habitat. Now let's add our next dot, the consumers. These are the animals that gobble up the producers. Picture a rabbit munching on some of that green leafy buffet, but consumers don't stop there. Some of them, like our friend the fox, prefer a different kind of meal. They're like the diners who skip the salad bar and head straight for the main course. In this case, the main course just happens to be our rabbit. But what happens when the dinner bell rings for the last time? That's where our decomposers come in. They're the cleanup crew, breaking down the leftovers, whether it's a fallen leaf or our fox friend at the end of his days. They turn everything back into nutrients that can be used by the producers, completing the cycle. But wait, there's more. 
Just like in our favorite detective novels, things are rarely as simple as they seem. You see, these food chains don't exist in isolation. They're all connected, forming an intricate web of life. The rabbit might be a meal for the fox, but it could also be a snack for a hawk. And that hawk might be the target of a larger predator. It's like a grand complex dance where everyone's both leading and following at the same time. This interconnected network, my friends, is what we call a food web. It's a beautiful dynamic system where everyone depends on everyone else. Like a giant, intricate jigsaw puzzle, each piece is crucial, and without one, the picture just isn't complete. In the grand game of survival, everyone is linked, it's like a giant, never-ending game of tag. Why doesn't a lion munch on grass or a cow feast on a zebra? It's all about the diet. The dietary preferences of animals determine their place in the food chain and are fascinatingly diverse. Let's delve into the world of carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores. Carnivores are the meat eaters of the animal kingdom. They're equipped with sharp teeth and claws, perfect for catching and devouring their prey. Lions, tigers, and eagles are all examples of carnivores. These creatures have evolved to become skilled hunters, capable of taking down animals larger than themselves. But let's not forget the smaller carnivores. Ever seen a house cat chase a mouse? That's a carnivore in action. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the herbivores. These creatures prefer a plant-based diet. They munch on leaves, grasses, fruits, and even tree bark. Deer, elephants, and rabbits are all herbivores. They're equipped with flat teeth designed for grinding up plant material. And it's not just about the teeth. Herbivores usually have a longer digestive tract to break down the tough plant fibers effectively. Now, what if I told you that some animals are like the best of both worlds? Enter the omnivores. These are animals that eat both plants and meat. Bears, raccoons, and yes, humans, are all omnivores. The ability to eat a varied diet allows these creatures to adapt to different environments and food availability. Each animal's diet is a result of millions of years of evolution and adaptation. They have developed specific traits and behaviors to help them find, catch, and digest their preferred food source. So whether it's the lion prowling the savanna for its next meal, the deer grazing peacefully in the meadow, or the bear rummaging through berries and fish alike, each animal's dietary preference plays a crucial role in maintaining the balance of their respective ecosystems. So next time you're choosing between a salad and a steak, remember you're an omnivore. You can have both. Ever noticed how a camel has a hump and a polar bear has thick fur? It's not just a fashion statement, it's about survival. Let's dive into the fascinating world of adaptations. Just like how we put on a coat when it's cold or wear sunglasses on a sunny day, animals and plants also have their own ways to cope with the environmental conditions of their habitats. These coping mechanisms are what we call adaptations. Take the camel, for example. It's not just carrying a hump for the fun of it. That hump is actually a storage unit for fat, providing the camel with energy and water when food and drink are scarce in the desert. Talk about a handy survival kit. On the other hand, polar bears, the fluffy giants of the Arctic, wear an all-season fur coat. But it's not just for looking stylish. Their thick fur and a layer of blubber underneath help them stay warm in freezing temperatures. Now let's turn our attention to the plant kingdom. You might wonder, how do plants which can't move or put on a coat survive in harsh conditions? Well, they've got some tricks up their photosynthetic sleeves too. Take the cactus, for instance. It's the poster child for desert survival. Rather than having leaves, which would lose water quickly in the dry desert air, cacti have spines. These spines not only protect them from hungry animals, but also help to reduce water loss. In addition, their thick, waxy skin helps to store water for those long, rainless desert days. In contrast, in the waterlogged, nutrient-poor conditions of a bog, carnivorous plants like the Venus flytrap have taken a slightly more aggressive approach. They've adapted to get some of their nutrients from a rather unconventional source. Insects. Yes, you heard it right. These plants have developed intricate trap mechanisms to catch and digest unsuspecting insects. So whether you're a cactus storing water or a polar bear staying warm, it's all about adapting to your habitat. Adaptations in all their glorious forms are nature's way of ensuring survival in the face of adversity. Why can't we just fill a forest with our favorite animals? Because like a superhero team, every habitat has a limit. Now, let's dive into the balancing act of habitats and why they can only support a certain number of organisms. Imagine a habitat as a grand, bustling city. 
Each building, park and alleyway has a specific purpose and can only accommodate a certain number of inhabitants. Similarly, every habitat provides a specific set of resources, such as food, water and shelter, and can only support a limited number of plants and animals. This is because these resources are not infinite. They regenerate at a certain pace, and if consumed too quickly, they can run out. Now let's bring in the concept of carrying capacity. This is the maximum population size that a particular habitat can support without causing environmental degradation. When a population exceeds its habitat's carrying capacity, it's like stuffing too many people into an elevator. It becomes overcrowded, resources become scarce and the habitat may suffer. But Mother Nature, in all her wisdom, has a way of maintaining balance. If a population grows too large, factors like food scarcity, disease and predators often come into play to reduce the population and restore equilibrium. This is akin to a natural checks and balances system. However, as humans we must also play our part in maintaining this delicate balance. Overhunting, deforestation and pollution can disrupt the natural balance of habitats, leading to the extinction of species and loss of biodiversity. It's like removing bricks from a carefully stacked Jenga tower, remove too many, and the whole structure collapses. So, the next time you think about introducing your favorite animal into a new habitat, remember the superhero team. Each member has a specific role, and adding too many members can disrupt the team's balance and effectiveness. In conclusion, habitats are not limitless supermarkets, but finely tuned ecosystems where every organism has a role to play. And just like any good team, they function best when there's a balance. Remember, in the game of life, it's all about balance. So, what have we uncovered in our habitat investigation? Quite a lot, actually. We've discovered that habitats are more than just homes. They're lifelines, providing every necessity for survival to the organisms residing there. We've explored how local habitats are dynamic ecosystems, where interactions between species shape the community. From food chains to intricate webs of life, we've seen how every organism, whether a producer, consumer or decomposer, plays a critical role in maintaining balance. We've dived into the fascinating world of dietary classifications, understanding that whether an animal is a carnivore, herbivore or omnivore, their diet is a key factor in their habitat. Our journey led us to the remarkable adaptations that allow plants and animals to thrive in specific habitats. And lastly, we've grasped the concept of habitat limits, realizing that even the most abundant habitats have a carrying capacity. Remember, every creature from the tiniest ant to the biggest elephant has its special place in the world. And that, my friends, is the magic of habitats.